This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on February 28th, 2020. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today here in Bethesda, Maryland, Rich Condit. Hello, Vincent. How are you? <laughs> it's the fourth time be. in two days. That's right. How about it's, that? it's a podcast marathon. We are on the campus of the National Institutes of Health, and our guest is back for a second time. He is a senior investigator and uh, head of the Evolutionary Genomics Research Group at the National Institutes of Health, Eugene Koonin. Welcome back. Thank you very much, Vincent. Rich, thank you very much for coming. It's a great pleasure to be back with you. We had last were here on episode 275. I'm going to show you a young Eugene there. Look, that was it. March 2014. It's almost to the to the day, right? Almost to the day, six years. Six, six years ago. Years, almost to the day. Has anything changed in six years? <laughs> um, yes, a lot. <laughs> yes. A lot. I'm uh, sure. Uh, uh, in some areas quantitatively, in some, uh, in other areas qualitatively. Mm -hmm. uh, um, certainly more junk accumulated in my office. <laughs> <laughs> Considerably more gray hair in my beard. Is and in yours, Vincent, too, by the way. And that's just aging. It's not stress from other things, right? Oh, d difficult, difficult to disambiguate that, but, but I think most aging. I think he looks the same, pretty much. I think so. I think you're yeah. an ageless person. Right? That's it. That, that would be good if that was true. I appreciate it very much. You guys, by the way, look good, too. Uh, uh, and not changed... Uh, Except for this little extra gray, not really changed. That's Actually, six important. years ago when we did this, I was still a working stiff. You were, you were working yeah. a job. Yeah. 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 Uh, but more important than any of that, I suppose, a lot, uh, and I think that, you know, a lot, all capitals, um, uh, has changed in, in virology itself, in my opinion. Yes, I agree. You have a lot of paper in your office, uh, Eugene. I thought, for, I thought a computer guy wouldn't have so much paper. <sighs> I still have some kind of existential difficulty uh, <laughs> getting rid of all my reprints from the olden years. Interesting. Okay. Uh, at, some po at some point, I'll, I'll just go on a rampage and destroy it. Okay. You think so? I don't I think uh, so, yes. And, think and so. then, so we'll come back someday and see if, uh, if that's the case, Yes, right? and let me show you in less than six years. Less than six years. Okay. Less. So you think it's been too long? It has been too long. It's overdue. Well, I, okay. I agree. I'm, I'm happy to come. In fact, we had said we'd be no, back. No, no, no. Uh, your absence, yes, but also cleaning up. Oh, well, that too, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's what you're talking about. But, but your absence too. You're the, in any case, the, the rate of change, at least during those years, has been accelerating only. For sure, yes. Mm, so in a sense, yes, overdue. So we're, we're going to try and cover some of the change today. Although I think the timing is good um, at the same time. So for listeners who want to know about Eugene's history, you can go to TWIV 275 where we talked about that. And so let's dive in. I want to start with a paper that uh, you and Valerian and Mart published, uh, Origin of Viruses, Primordial Replicators Recruiting Capsids from Hosts. Okay. All right. I'm sure you remember it very well. Yes. My, my short-term memory at least is just fine. It was <laughs> only a few months ago. <laughs> I think this is an amazing paper where every sentence is full of information. You know, every sentence has, has a lot of background. So let's try and go over it. But let's start with the question, what, what are the three hypotheses for the origins of viruses? Sure. Uh, mm, so over the last century almost, almost since the, pretty much since the days, uh, Felix Derrell uh, discovered bacteriophages in 1917. Uh, uh, the origin of viruses has been discussed. Um, and within a couple of decades after the discovery, it crystallized into these two uh, um, principal schemes. Number one, the reduction hypothesis, which posits uh, uh, that viruses out there are the ultimate 
phase of um, reductive cellular evolution. Mm -hmm. mm, uh, that is, we start with a fully fledged autonomous um, microbial. So, bacteria perhaps, mm, um, uh, which then degrades into something resembling intracellular parasitic bacteria, such as, for instance, rickettsia, uh, but then makes the um, decisive leap of reduction uh, mm, uh, and uh, degrades to the stage of a virus. Mm -hmm. So, that's the reductive evolution scenario. So in that hypothesis, viruses are exclusively post-cellular. You have cells first and then viruses evolve. By design of the hypothesis, okay. absolutely. Right. Uh, so, mm, uh, mm, so the second hypothesis, I will mention them in that order. There can be different logic in this, but I will mention them in that order. Uh, the second hypothesis, uh, mm, uh, which is the diametrical opposite of it, uh, is what we may be called the primordial gene pool hypothesis or virus early hypothesis, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, postulates, uh, based on the small size of the virus uh, uh, genomes, uh, uh, based on the diversity of the um, uh, yeah, genome uh, structure and replication and expression strategies in, vi in viruses, uh, that viruses are actually direct descendants of uh, primordial genetic entities uh, that existed even before uh, the origin of cellular life forms. And interestingly, uh, that idea, which I think is very prescient, if not exactly correct, has been proposed by J.B.S. Haldane back in 1927 without effectively a shred of evidence, just on pure logic. So that is the uh, mm, uh, second scenario. And the first scenario, which at least in virology textbook, textbooks, uh, mm, I think has been the most popular. Mm. Uh, is the so-called escaped genes scenario, escaped genes rather, uh, according to which uh, viruses uh, originate from uh, genes of uh, cellular hosts that somehow have escaped from the cell from the cellular genome and um, acquired replicative autonomy. Mm -hmm. um, so these are the okay. three. Uh, main scenarios, as you pointed out uh, uh, quite rightly, Rich, uh, uh, the first reductive scenario, in the first reductive scenario, mm, viruses are exclusively post-cellular. So are they in the, in the escape gene scenario. In that respect, those two are somewhat similar. Mm, although not in other respects, uh, mm, oh, whereas in the virus early scenario, again by by the by the design of that scenario, viruses come early. Okay, before so, cells. So, so what is it? What do we know that makes these three unlikely on their own? Well, that is a mm, uh, very uh, uh, mm, uh, good question, mm, and. Uh, and let me go through them consecutively mm -hmm. to indicate why, at least at face value and in the simplest, purest form, each of them is implausible. Okay. Mm, uh, let us uh, uh, proceed mm, in that same origin, uh, in that same order, sorry. Uh, yeah, let's proceed in that same order uh, uh, as I outlined them a few minutes ago. Mm, and accordingly begin with the reductive uh, mm, scenario. We see really no, in nature, we see no forms intermediate between viruses and cells uh, whatsoever. In, 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 in what sense? I think there are two areas of um, um, biological function uh, where um, uh, viruses 
differ from cells dramatically, qualitatively. Mm, and one is translation, uh, making of proteins mm, with the help of the ribosomal machinery. Uh, every single cell on Earth is endowed with effectively complete translation machinery, and that machinery is conserved among, uh, between all, uh, among all cellular life forms. Mm, indicating clearly that it comes back at least to the last universal common ancestor of cellular life. Viruses, some viruses, not many, but some, uh, have certain components of the translation system, and this, we may touch upon this later, perhaps, um, mm, uh, but none has anything like a complete translation system. And that's one fundamental difference. Mm -hmm. The other difference that perhaps is even more fundamental um, um, is the absence in viruses of their own energy transformation mechanisms. Every cell, again, on Earth has an, so to speak, energizable membrane, a membrane that is hmm. uh, um, capable of creating and maintaining uh, gradients of um, uh, ions and um, electric potential. Energy, simply put. Mm, none of the viruses has anything like this. They have their own, quite a few of them have their own membranes, all right, but these are derived from cellular membranes uh, and are not energizable. There is, uh, that gulf does not seem to be possible by any life form in any of the, of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, hypothetically imaginable directions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's for the reductive hypothesis. Despite some revival in some speculative literature lately, <laughs> for the reasons of which we may mention later, um, I think <coughs> this is completely impossible. Now, uh, mm, uh, the mm, uh, primordial virus early hypothesis, according to which viruses come from the mm, primordial gene pool. And here, I do, uh, a few years ago, to be candid about it, even a few years ago, even at the time, to be more concrete, at the time of our previous discussion mm. in, or the previous interview for this very podcast six years ago, mm, I considered that hypothesis to be highly plausible, mm -hmm. more or less in its entirety. Uh, although um, I have taken quite a bit of flake for that, because, uh, mm, and maybe rightly so, um, mm, uh, because People immediately ask, wait a minute, uh, what is it even supposed to mean, viruses early? What are you talking about? Viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. How come <laughs> mm -hmm. viruses before cells? Uh, mm, to which, of course, I respond, yes, indeed, if you want to be so rigid uh, about the definitions. Uh, mm, uh, but uh, I would like to define viruses more <coughs> broadly more like selfish genetic elements mm -hmm. that, and in that capacity, uh, they could have preceded cells. As for virion structures, uh, that turns out to be a crucial point. Um, it's more dubious, and it's unclear how such structures would function in the primordial stage, but one still could imagine some benefits from it as a protective shell, uh, for these um, ancient genetic elements, and um, therefore it did not seem, on first principles, entirely implausible uh, um, uh, that viruses as such, uh, um, I always, ha I rather hate this, but I always have to say virus-like entities, mm -hmm. or virus-like agents or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, evolved even before cells. So, so 
that scenario seemed plausible. However, I do not think that it stands very well to empirical tests. Mm. Mm, and in the years that elapsed uh, mm, uh, since our last conversation in this series, um, mm, um, no, my constant collaborator in these matters, Mark Kropovich, uh, and I uh, have undertaken uh, mm, quite a comprehensive uh, mm, analysis of the evolutionary origins of the capsid proteins and other major components of uh, virions of all sorts of viruses. And what we found, frankly, somewhat to my surprise, mm, mm, uh, is that in the great majority of cases for the major widespread uh, mm, virion proteins, we identify cellular ancestors. Mm -hmm. mm, and we are fairly confident uh, the, uh, about the directionality of evolution in this case. The directionality of, uh, of evolution is always harder, almost by definition harder to infer, uh, than uh, the existence of evolutionary relationships per mm -hmm. se. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, what governs here is more or less the diversity principle. We have, um, 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 let us say, for the most common virus capsid protein, the so-called single jelly roll capsid protein, of which icosahedral uh, um, uh, variants of the huge diversity of virus are made. Uh, um, we find um, cellular homologues mm -hmm. uh, um, that belongs to a very sprawling, one, um, common family of cellular domains that are primarily involved in uh, um, uh, binding of various kinds of carbohydrates, which makes sense in terms of the viral mm -hmm. structure. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but the key point is there that this is a diverse family, and virus capsid proteins, for all we can tell, seem to originate, originate from the inside uh, um, of that uh, protein superfamily, even though the um, sequence similarities are very low, and we have to um, turn to structural comparisons, but these letter indicated with considerable clarity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, we come to the conclusion uh, uh, that uh, um, the virion components actually, uh, the main virion components, let's say, uh, probably all by extension, uh, um, follow um, in the evolution uh, the escape gene scenario. They are actually escape mm. genes. This, however, is not the case when we come to the uh, mm, uh, key components of the replication machineries of viruses. Mm. What we find there uh, is very striking in the sense that the uh, mm, uh, polymerases that are involved uh, mm, in the uh, replication of all uh, mm, mm, kinds of virus genomes, both RNA genomes and DNA genomes and those that uh, replicate by reverse transcription and even those that do not really uh, mm, uh, uh, replicate but uh, mm, only encode proteins involved in and the nucleases involved in initiation of replication. Uh, they all are, are built on the basis of this of one and the same protein domain. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the uh, so-called RNA recognition motif, mm -hmm. which is a very common RNA binding domain, uh, but um, um, uh, which exists in a non-enzymatic incarnation, mm -hmm. uh, um, but also assumes a, a variety of uh, um, enzymatic function, uh, functions. Uh, um, uh, for all we know, this would be one of those protein domains that emerged right at the exit of the evolving life from the RNA world stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and this domain gives rise, um, um, perhaps in some kind of ancient burst of evolution, to the replicative machineries of all known viruses. Um, um, so here, I think, the evidence points um, um, to the primordial pool virus early scenario. Mm -hmm. Hence, 
uh, uh, the title of that um, article that you mentioned, Vincent, uh, um, uh, the chimeric scenario for the origin of viruses, whereby the uh, replicative modules of viruses um, originate directly from the primordial pool of replicators, mm -hmm. whereas uh, um, uh, the structural and morphogenetic machinery of uh, uh, machinery of viruses, the second major module of uh, virus genes, um, it has been acquired subsequently at, on several, okay, several independent occasions from cellular hosts in accordance with the escape genes mm -hmm. scenario. Hence, this chimeric scenario, which incidentally puts to rest that question, how come might it be possible that viruses evolved before cells? They did not quite. The real viruses haven't. Well, it depends what you call a virus. Yeah, if you need right. a capsid on a virus yes. or not, and you mention that a lot, whether the capsid is a defining feature, and I'm not, I'm not sure it is because I consider a viroid to be a virus. I don't know if you do. Uh, <laughs> you know, we do not want, I think, in in such discussions to uh. turn to philosophical essentialism <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, and 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 consider, you know, whether. You know, X is A um, and Y is B or not. Yeah. Or, um, not necessarily. So, um, but for the sake of operational definitions, yeah. I actually would not consider viroid to be a virus. A virus. Um, certainly, there is a broader category of entities uh, that, that perhaps is, are best denoted as mobile genetic elements. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay. And then viroids, or, viroids, okay. or, or right. perhaps selfish elements. It's a bit of a loaded word, but anyhow. Right. Well, so I'm happy to say yeah. that the, the primordial replicators are primordial replicators. Okay. We don't have to call them viruses. That's Let's fine. And in fact, but because we are so used to the name virus as being a parasite of cells that it would be hard to change it at this point. Yes, so and, I, they, and they think structures are also important. So let's call viruses uh, um, uh, those... Uh, um, that variety of mobile, uh, mobile selfish genetic elements uh, that um, encode uh, um, uh, the particles that enca encapsulate their own genome. Mm -hmm. Or, okay. there's always exception biology, of course, or they direct derivatives. Because mm -hmm. there are viruses who are like, let's say, quite many fungal viruses, so-called nanoviruses and metaviruses that have lost their capsids. They mm -hmm. clearly evolved from real viruses and, and more like that. Okay. Those we will still call viruses. We can see the directionality there clearly. Uh, very clear directionality. Okay. Uh, indeed. Of course, we are mm, also faced with weird cases uh, like, say, hepatitis delta, where the directionality apparently is the opposite from something like a viroid to something that qualifies as a virus. Mm -hmm. it, it takes a capsid from another virus, so that's okay, right, in the definition of virus. I think somewhere it, you said helper dependent. It doesn't really even take a capsid from another virus. Mm. It takes a capsid from who knows where. That's true. Now we know others, too, yeah. No. <laughs> so, we, we used mm, to. Mm, mm, <laughs> but by operation, operationally, it becomes a virus. Okay. So there are these weird situations. Nevertheless, I think for the mm. typical viruses, uh, um, um, the bulk of the evidence points to that kind of uh, hybrid scenario. So this uh, this fascinates me because um, you're really in querying about the origins of virus. You're getting back to the really the origins of life, which uh, I just find fascinating. And I want to remind the listeners that the experimental technique we're talking about here is computational biology, right? You're doing this with sequences and a computer, right? Sequences and structures. And structures. All, oh, in, and the structure. all in the computer. And structure, all in the computer. So I don't so, know if we should call that <clears throat> experimental technique, but surely a method it is. But so, I would say that there are some experiments. So the primer independent polymerase is an experiment. And that contributes to the theory a, a bit, right? 
the, the evolution of polymerases now? Yes. It certainly does contribute to, uh, to theory. I'm only saying that we ourselves are not yeah, yeah, conducting sure. but any But Mark experiment. does some wet experiments in Paris, right? Um, nowadays, yes. <laughs> Do you need juice, electrons? Uh, you know, uh, oh, I see what I did, I think. You pulled apart your uh, thing. Know. You need a new computer. Yeah, I do. I need a new computer. So, I don't it, care. In this pre-cellular world of replicators, and there is evidence today you can construct self-replicating nucleic acid-like molecules, right? There's some. There, there is has been considerable and very ingenious experimentation in that area. Mm -hmm. Excuse and me. There is, yeah. uh, no problem. No problem. Uh, and there is some uh, uh, evidence of polymerase activities mm -hmm. uh, comprised of RNA molecules. But okay. as it happens, there is no such thing so far as a processive polymerase made of nucleic acid. Okay, that's fair. So in this, pr this primordial pool, initially it is RNA? Uh, uh, or is it a mix? We believe, we believe so, that mm, mm, the very original, very first pool of replicators uh, mm, consisted of RNA and perhaps also peptides, uh, mm, uh, but, uh, mm. Mm, but not those encoded in nucleic acids. Right. With the genetic code being a later invention. Okay. Uh, genetic code and translation system being later inventions. Mm. This is not, this is a hypothesis that faces its, its own difficulties, but I do not see another logically admissible one. Mm -hmm. You talked about, when you were talking earlier, you talked about the emergence from the RNA world. And to me, I'm, I'm interested in what you are thinking about that because that strikes that boundary strikes me as the evolution of the code is that right i i would have to agree the code uh evolution of the code which is not which is inseparable from the evolution of the machinery that reads the code mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and this is a step of enormous difficulty and although there have been speculations, and I contributed to some of those at some points, for this we do not have any kind of satisfactory scheme, even hypothetically, let alone experimentally. Okay. But you think that the RNA recognition motif could have arisen in a, a, a world without a code with just peptides? Now, this is a real tough question. I have my doubts about that. Not, not in its complete form, but perhaps in a partial form, as perhaps a single beta hairpin. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Possibly. Okay. So, one thing that uh, interests me here is that in doing this sort of uh, computational approach to evolutionary biology. There must be, you must be, have some sense of the actual times involved. Uh, can you put a date on the evolution of cellular life? Can you tell me, can you put a date on pre-cellular life? And does the computation actually say, yes, the RNA replication motifs predate the capsid proteins? These are good questions and tough questions, Rich, beyond doubt. Um, now, one has to realize that computation it itself can tell you nothing uh, about astronomical times. Um, it, it, in order to be able to do so, 
it must be linked to some calibration point. Okay. It may be, it, it is capable of giving you the likely sequence of events. Okay. Not so relative times. Relative times. But you can't, you need a fossil or something to... For absolute times, you need some kind of fossils. And while in the relatively recent times, we've been, let us say, the last half a billion years, uh, there are many fossils and they, and they give us reasonable calibration point and there you can calibrate molecular clock with some reasonable precision. Uh, below that, however, all this becomes very shaky, all these calibration points. So, 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 calibrate, so um, inferring times is very difficult. That said, calib uh, reasonable calibration points exist. Uh, and I think paleontological evidence is, uh, 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 fossil evidence is sufficient uh, um, uh, these days uh, to be confident that cellular life forms already did exist and moreover diversified to some extent 3.5 billion years ago. Cellular life forms, yes. Yes. Were they uh, RNA based or DNA based or both? Don't, we don't know. We do not know that. But we could have an RNA-based cell, right? Uh, I personally mm, find it beyond belief okay. that, uh, let me specify what I find it. <laughs> sorry, uh, sorry. That, uh, yeah, that, I'm that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that uh, mm, there have been cells um, mm, resembling distinct forms of modern bacteria, such as, for, inst for instance, cyanobacteria, based on RNA genetic material. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There might have been some protocells with RNA genomes, but I don't think that these are the fossil records that people are mm -hmm. observing. Mm -hmm. the, the observed fossil record is, is of modern type cells with DNA genomes. The right. cells that, okay. if we had the time machine and could travel there, you would probably find hard to distinguish from modern prokaryotes. I think so, at least. Okay, okay. that's fair. Yeah, mm, so something like that mm. apparently existed uh, mm, by 3.5 billion years ago. So whatever happened before, uh, whatever preceded uh, those cells, and under any type of acceptable scientific thinking, they could not have <laughs> appear in one leap. Um, mm, mm, so there must have been uh, intermediate stages, mm, and they must have existed before that day. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, uh, we also know that the planets of the solar system are created from, roughly speaking, cosmic dust, something like 4.5, maybe 4.6 billion years ago. And for the first half billion years ago, the conditions on that young planet were so harsh, harsh in terms of radiation levels, um, temperature, volcanic activity, uh, that um, even the existence, stable existence of any kind of polymers is hardly imaginable. So we are left, roughly, um, with half a billion years between 4 billion years ago and 3.5 hmm. for all the precellular stages of life evolution from the first uh, um, RNA molecules, let us say, if this was the first po form of protobiological polymer, mm -hmm. um, to, the, to the cells. So, oh, yes. looking at the, once again, the computational biology, you have this, now this chimeric model where yeah. the replication, yeah. uh, the replicons uh, are precellular and they ultimately cop um, uh, structural proteins mm -hmm. from the cells. Yes. Uh, uh, does the computational biology support that from the point of view that the replicons or the 
uh, uh, RRM, the ribos, the RNA recognition motif is older than the capsid proteins we're talking about? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, I would say all the evidence is compatible with that. For, for the less common capsid proteins, we can indicate later origins, making it gaining confidence that this does happen. Now, for the most common ones, like the jelly roll, it is hard, much harder at least. Nevertheless, the RRM um, mm, domain uh, permeates the entire life, uh, all cells uh, mm, and pretty much all viruses. Mm. Uh, whereas uh, the in fact, precursors, uh, ancestors of capsid proteins are widespread, but not to a similar extent. Okay. Mm, uh, so, uh, mm, I would not say that this constitutes incontrovertible evidence. Uh, mm, uh, but, yeah, I, I, uh, I dare say that it is fully compatible uh, with the mm, postulates of that hypothesis. So, in the, uh, in the, among the the replicons, the RRM-containing proteins. There are a variety of different proteins involved in different replication modes. Is that my understanding is correctly? Your understanding is quite correct. These domains uh, um, are at the core of RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, reverse transcriptases, and DNA polymerases uh, that are involved in the uh, um, uh, replication of uh, many diverse uh, um, double-stranded DNA viruses, although some don't have it and rely on uh, um, cellular machinery, as well as uh, the uh, um, um, replication initiation and the nucleus uh, that is essential for uh, um, uh, um, so-called roll rolling circle replication in all single-strand DNA viruses. So the enzymes, the DNA polymerases that uh, are used in cells do they have this, are they on the same evolutionary, is that a different evolutionary track? Mm, a very interesting question. Uh, because mm, uh, the polymerases uh, that are involved in the mm, replication of the gene, that are central to the replication of the genome, are different mm, among the three so-called domains of the cellular life. Bacteria, archaea, um, mm, uh, and uh, eukaryotes. So, interestingly enough, the eukaryotic polymerases, DNA polymerases, are based on uh, the RRM domain. Okay. Archaea do have such polymerases, but the main polymerase that is required for replication, so-called PoD, that is central to the replication in most of their care, is of a different provenance. Mm. If, if interesting, we can touch on this, although this is not okay. directly related to viruses, perhaps. And uh, mm, uh, the replicative polymerase uh, of bacteria is something different yet. The so-called Paul Beta domain, which is unrelated to either of those. Uh, mm, so there is no single answer to your question. But I think it is an interesting and significant fact uh, that uh, the eukaryotic polymerases share this core domain with the viral ones. So they evolved for the replicons, the replicators, and then were taken by cells? Perhaps you, you, perhaps you, 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 are, you are getting my, my drift correctly. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, um, uh, we actually have a paper submitted describing okay. that scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, um, uh, just very briefly. Interesting for the general topic of the origin and evolution of life. Um, uh, there was recently a 
great insight, in my opinion, uh, from the mm, mm, structure of the archaeo replicative polymerase, so called mm -hmm. PO D, uh, mm, which, which was for technical reasons difficult to solve, but, but it was done. Mm, and it turned out something very remarkable uh, that mm, its core catalytic domain is homologous to those uh, mm, uh, that are present in uh, all DNA-directed RNA polymerases that are involved in transcription in all cellular life forms. Mm -hmm. So the core mm -hmm. transcription is universal across cellular life. Many viruses have it too, but apparently so derived. Mm, uh, so, mm, mm, and it turned out that our Q uh, mm, uh, or replication machinery has a common origin with the universal transcription machinery. Mm. Mm. So my take on this is that this is the primordial form of replication that was present in the last universal cellular mm -hmm. ancestor. And even beyond, uh, as, a, um, um, as an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase in the RNA world. Mm -hmm. mm. And later, you know, this symmetry breaking into uh, um, uh, replication and transcription occurred. But then, the, the second line of evolution was on, um, based on the RRM domain and occurred primarily in the world of these uh, um, uh, mobile selfish elements and later viruses and then has been co-opted by archaea um, and replaced the ancestral replication machinery in some of the archaea and in all eukaryotes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you uh, uh, speak of the evolution of the structural proteins from uh, cells. How many different uh, sort of origins are we talking about? There's multiple evolutions. That right? is correct. Uh, there are multiple origins, and we are talking about roughly 20 to 30 points of okay. origin across the virus world. And you... Uh, uh, state in this perspectives paper and in, in the capsid protein paper, I think, as well, yes. that there's evidence for this happening multiple times during evolution. Right? And at different stages of evolution. Okay. So you have replicons that are trying out new clothes at different um, times. We have replicons that are trying new clothes, including changing their clothes dramatically. Okay. Mm. We have uh, mm, uh, viruses that in the course of their evolution um, mm, decide to switch to a completely new fashion trend, so to okay. speak. <laughs> so, you, most of the viruses have icosahedral caps. The majority, yes. 60%, I think, was your number. Something like that. All right, so then we have uh, enveloped viruses with helical nucleocapsids. Yes. Do those seem to come from cell proteins as well, the nucleocapsid proteins? Uh, yes, they also seem to come okay. uh, come from cellular proteins of a different kind of um, mm -hmm. or proteins that are involved in the formation of the nuclear lamina and the like. Okay, and what about the glycoproteins that are in the membrane? Oh, um, viral glycoproteins. Yes. These are difficult. For these, we do not necessarily have. Um, for the more common of these, I'm afraid, we do not necessarily trace the cellular ancestors. Because I know that there's some self, self gamete fusion proteins that are similar. Yes, to yes, yes. Uh, but we the, don't know yeah, the direction the there. No, right? the fusion proteins, yes. Uh, for the fusion proteins, yes. Uh, we do not know the direction, but um, um, the more carefully we look, uh, the more confident we are about the same direction, okay. from okay. cellular fusogens to viral. They are just very fast evolving and really difficult to identify by sequence alone. Okay. So one thing I want to clarify is, does, uh, does this chimeric model for the evolution of viruses account for both RNA and DNA viruses? By every account. Okay. Yeah. So th there's one last step I want to get some insight into and you know we're already on cells and viruses capturing uh, structural proteins but can we back up so there was a pool of RNA replicators would you need a protein coding system to make DNA yes 
Yeah, oh, uh, uh, yes, I... I think that is the logic of events. Mm. Uh, that is, purely hypothetically, um, one can speculate on the origin of uh, um, uh, DNA polymerase, of RNA-based DNA polymerases, yeah. 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 Um, and ribonucleotide reductases, for mm -hmm. that matter, because mm -hmm. they are necessary. Uh, mm, and the advent of DNA before proteins, but I think that makes no sense. Yeah, but do you need a cell first to have made DNA? Can you make protein outside of a cell? That, I guess that's the question. A great question, and uh, mm, uh, mm, my, my take on it is probably not, but uh, mm. it depends on what you define as a cell on how you define a cell. Mm, uh, one thing is absolutely certain. Mm -hmm. uh, some form of fairly efficient compartmentalization was necessary. Okay. This could not uh, occur in, in any kind of, you know, apparent-type bullion, uh, apparent-type broth uh, uh, taken literally. It could have been a broth, all right, but, uh, but in droplets that have to yeah. be encapsulated yeah. into something, some sort of compartment. There have been scenarios, and I admit that I found them quite interesting and have been developing a little bit for a while, actually, on inorganic compartments that would host these primordial pools. But I think most realistically, we have to think about the origin of some kind of membrane vesicles with proto-metabolic -metaboli networks uh, that would supply monomers for replication and the origin of replication only after that. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's hard to imagine ribosomes floating around and making protein, right? So compartmentalization is, makes a lot of sense. Compartmentalization is, is an absolute must. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's impossible to, to, uh, to reach anywhere far right. without it. What was the mechanism of compartmentalization? Sure. It's a bit of a different question, but I think that we uh, will be better off um, including the directions of experimentation uh, 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 with um, um, the scenario uh, that includes uh, uh, lipid vesicles emerging early, prior to the replication of nucleic acids. Yeah, and then let alone translation. Right, and then you can imagine translation emerging, and then that would be necessary for. I can't emerging. imagine translation emerging. I well, have the, a, the actual <laughs> emergence. The, mecha I have yeah, a real yeah, problem the mechanism is very, very difficult. Yeah, uh, yeah, but 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 we, it did emerge, however. Right, uh, <laughs> mm, mm, uh, and uh, mm, uh, and not to make life super difficult. Uh, I think we have to. Take uh, to to assume that it emerged within some sort of lipid vesicles uh, where um, that provided supply of monomers, at least mm -hmm. through some network of metabolic reactions, right. perhaps even right. self-perpetuating network. So the the chimeric hypothesis, mobile uh, self-replicators invading cells taking capsid genes. Is that happening today? Mm, is that happening today? Uh, as I mentioned, we are now, I think we now have a fairly good take on the diversity of, the main diversity of viruses on Earth. And looking at the diversity, uh, mm, uh, we are inferring uh, mm, as I said, about 20 to 30, that may grow to 40 or 50, as we, as we proceed, points of origin of variants. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not going to grow to thousands. Okay. L not even hundreds, I am fairly sure. Mm, uh, and therefore, uh, mm, the answer to your question is yes and no in the sense that it may happen today, 
or tomorrow, but it's a very rare event. It does not, oh, one thing is for, uh, is for sure, it does not happen every week. <laughs> yeah. uh, what percentage of the diversity have, do we know, by the way, the viral diversity, would you say? Okay. Oh, mm, all this, oh, the answer to this question crucially depends or oh, at the level of granularity we are interested in and that we are looking at. Mm. So, in terms of what we may call, and this is related to many things, many important issues, uh, if we are talking about what may be called virus species, mm. or even virus genera, whereby you know, the, the most concerned parties within the virus genera would be something like you know, 80 to 90 percent identity, mm. something like that. If we are looking at the diversity at this mesoscopic mm. level, if you may call it, or microscopic, depends on the definition, we are very, very far from saturation. We know a tiny fraction mm. you know, of the diversity that actually exists. If, however, uh, we move up or um, on the organizational scale, or uh, and look at the major divisions of viruses, major monophyletic groups, um, then I think, at least my understanding of this is that we know a very substantial fraction mm -hmm. of diversity. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, we may already know the majority of the major classes of viruses. Okay. So if a new one ar arose, we might never see it. You know, oh. by, by, by invasion of a, a replicator invading a cell, as you said. It doesn't happen every week, but it, maybe it happened once every 10 years. We'd never see this, probably, right? Because it would be so rare? Yes. Perhaps. Oh, mm, it, yes, of course, we are, whenever you study major diversity of anything at yeah, all, sure. there is a long tail yeah. of very rare things. And uh, not to oversimplify, even now, although we have a quite a good classification of viruses, it would be more prudent to say uh, that we have a good classification of common viruses. Mm. Uh, there are unique, enigmatic, fascinating ones of which we are aware, and mm -hmm. I'm sure more of which we are not. Mm. But if it comes to common ones, I think they already know most of the widespread groups. Okay. Do you want to move on to the RNA virome? Uh, or do you have something else you want to... No, that's fine. Move on. Okay. So the RNA virome, you, you published a paper on the origin and evolution of it because and this was made or, oh, oh so Sorry. this was made possible by RNA dependent RNA polymerase can you explain that the, the, this whole, whole classification work, yes 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 of course okay uh, uh, the thing of the matter is that um, um, no, the universal phylogeny the the um, global phylogeny of cellular life forms is based on some universal markers, uh, genetic markers, right. such as ribosomal RNAs, um, RNA polymerases, or ribosomal proteins. There aren't that many, but maybe about a hundred that you can use to some extent. Now, there is no such thing as a universal marker among all viruses. Mm -hmm. Simply zero. Among all RNA and reverse transcribing viruses, however, there is a universal marker, but only one single marker like that, so there is no choice. Uh, the only molecule uh, that is suitable for building uh, the big tree of these viruses is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, mm -hmm. which is also homologous to the reverse transcriptase. Okay. Uh, so uh, if you want some kind of universal scaffold to understand the evolution of the and diversity of these, vi of these viruses, you simply have no choice. Okay. Uh, by the way, We'll talk about the classification, but why do RNA viruses dominate the eukaryotic virome? Do we understand this? No, uh, we do not. Uh, mm, uh, indeed, they dominate, although the domination is 
let us say, squid, the level of this, the extent of this domination. Um, actually, even the, the reality of this domination differs dramatically mm. between different um, supergroups, let's say, of eukaryotes. Mm. Let's say, in plants, this domination is very dramatic. In animals, mm, not nearly as dramatic. Mm. There are many DNA viruses, they rival in um, RNA viruses and their diversity. Mm. In many unicellular um, eukaryotes, we, may, we do not know enough, but it may even be inverted, mm. such that, um, um, let us say in algae, um, DNA viruses may even be more common. Okay. So that domination okay. actually, in part, is based on a bias. I got it. Uh, mm, okay. mm, uh, that we have uh, due to our far superior knowledge of uh, animal and plant viruses. Now about animals and plants, we do seem to understand something at some level. Uh, namely that uh, plants seem to um, exclude uh, mm, large double-stranded DNA viruses, or even moderate-sized double-stranded DNA viruses, uh, because neither the virion nor naked DNA, uh, yeah, neither mm, uh, the virion nor any other form of the DNA would pass from the, through the plasma desmata. Okay. okay. And, and mm -hmm. in bacteria, is it correct that there are not a, a great diversity of RNA viruses, right? Uh, yes. Uh, there is no great diversity of RNA viruses, no diversity that would be uh, mm, uh, comparable to that of DNA viruses. There, the diversity of both of them is underappreciated. Yeah. We're still discovering many RNA viruses and bacteria, uh, but nothing is going to change that pattern. Okay, but you, mm. and again, we don't understand why that is the case. No, we do not. My own explanation is sort of a competition explanation, mm. uh, mm, uh, namely that uh, in, euka in eukaryotes, uh, you have the nucleus, which is the site of DNA replication, mm. and we have the cytosol with the um, uh, um, expensive endomembrane system. Uh, um, now, the nucleus, um, among its many f uh, functions, serves as a barrier to DNA viruses. Conversely, eukaryotes uh, have evolved all kinds of defense mechanisms that take advantage of the fact that normally there is no DNA in the cytosol, mm -hmm. uh, and are very efficient in detecting and destroy, destroying uh, cytosolic mm -hmm. DNA. Uh, um, so the conditions within um, um, a eukaryotic cell are really harsh for DNA viruses. Granted, quite a few of them have overcome that, mm -hmm. those defenses by either finding mm -hmm. their way to the nucleus or finding the um, evolving uh, means to uh, um, develop semi-autonomous factories within the cytosol. Uh, but it has been a challenging path of adaptation. And in bacteria, is it, is it also correct that... The, 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 is it possible that the... Well, there's no nucleus in a bacterium, yes. so is that hostile for RNA? It is hostile for RNA, uh, and the endomembrane systems of eukaryotes, for reasons we do not really understand, but they do seem to be rather hospitable to RNA replication. Yeah, that's right. Uh, mm, uh, bacteria, bacterial cells uh, mm, are hostile to RNA, uh, mm, but that means there is also very active RNA degradation. Bacterial mRNAs, for instance, are short-lived. They're degraded right. quickly. Right. Uh, and, and the same fate befalls the virus RNA, um, unless it's protected somehow specifically. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's much more challenging for uh, bacteria and archaea to defend against DNA viruses. So the, the, and also bacteria have an absence of this membrane environment in the cell, right? Yes. Which may uh, protect, it, it would normally protect RNA viruses. Which, prot which has been harnessed by RNA viruses okay. for protection, okay. but it does Got not it. exist in bacteria okay. indeed, or, or archaea. So back to the RNA, uh, the RDRP, is yes. a marker for all RNA viruses and reverse transcribing. Correct. RNA, 
but also oh, it's, it's with DNA, yeah. DNA hepatitis all B. All the neuron transcribing virus. Okay, so you you use that to look at all the thousands of sequences that were available. Indeed, right? yes. And you can approximate the order of appearance of different kinds of uh, RNA viruses, right? Can you tell us? To some extent, yes, and I can okay. try. Um, mm, uh, so, so some time ago, uh, mm, the, mm, indeed, painstakingly collected many thousand of, of virus sequences, uh, mm, uh, isolated their DRP sequences from them, uh, mm, clustered these sequences to uh, mm, obtain uh, groups of related ones and make the whole thing manageable to some extent, arrived to something like 5,000 of such clusters, mm. um, uh, and then uh, um, uh, made a, a huge phylogenetic tree um, out of those sequences. Uh, fortunately, uh, that phylogenetic tree uh, comes out with a fairly well-defined structure. Mm. Topology, as we say, mm -hmm. in the phylogenetic business. <laughs> uh, mm, uh, and that uh, mm, uh, tree uh, mm, contains, uh, when you root it to the reverse transcript phase, which is distinct, uh, that uh, mm, uh, tree uh, contains uh, five major branches, mm -hmm. mm, uh, which are uh, primarily uh, mm, a positive sense RNA viruses, that is, those that incorporate uh, a molecule of the same polarity as, MR, as, as the mRNA mm -hmm. in the virus uh, particle. And from within that diversity, um, mm, on two distinct occasions, grow the branches of double stranded RNA viruses. And from one of the, from the biggest group of double stranded DNA viruses, grows the branch of negative sense. RNA viruses. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. uh, these brand, importantly, I think, these branches are very strongly statistically mm -hmm. supported. Mm -hmm. they, are, they are quite robust. The relationship between them is a harder matter, uh, but the, those five branches are very uh, strongly supported. I think you point out in the paper that the emergence of negative strand from double stranded was surprising. Yes and no. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, in the sense that we have not been really thinking uh, about such a relationship, mm -hmm. and yet it springs out quite confidently from the midst of uh, double-strand RNA viruses. Not really if you think about it uh, in, <laughs> in, uh, in purely logical terms. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, if you know the original form, is positive sense RNA, which makes sense. It's the simplest strategy. You don't need to package any enzymatic machinery in your virus particles. Uh, and from that, there is a fairly obvious transition to double-stranded genomes. Mm -hmm. And from that, you disc sort of discard from the very yeah. the original positive sense strand uh, and come to negative sense. So mm -hmm. come to think of this. It's a very simple scheme of evolution. Yeah. Where are the reverse transcribing viruses on this tree? A bit of a different matter. Uh, mm, uh, the reverse transcribing viruses are outside. Mm. Um, uh, uh, mm, uh, and uh, uh, mm. the thing with reverse trans mm, transcription is that um, mm, reverse transcription is ubiquitous in life. However, prokaryotes only harbor reverse transcribing uh, transposable uh, mobile elements mm -hmm. of different kinds, quite many, uh, mm, uh, but not viruses. Mm -hmm. The viruses only evolved in eukarya. Mm -hmm. mm. um, uh, and uh, they apparently evolved on at least two occasions. Uh, yeah, different viruses, one occasion is uh, mm, RNA, uh, uh, RNA containing reverse transcribing viruses and one of the groups of DNA containing those colimoviruses, a plant variety, mm. and the other occasion are um, 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 uh, hepatitis B viruses right. and their relatives. Uh, these have unrelated capsid proteins. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, 
uh, s- somehow that's hard for me to get my head around as well, is inventing something like that twice. Nevertheless, we really have to, uh, because uh, mm, no, there, this, this, uh, one has to keep in mind geometrical constraints. Okay. Uh, mm, mm. Ge- geometrical slash thermodynamic constraints. Uh, mm, creating some shapes are much better than others. Uh, mm, for instance, icosahedral capsids have been... Uh, mm, uh, Evo- have evolved on several occasions in okay. evolution. One, one form is much more common than others, but it happened on several occasions. Um, in the least three major occasions, but I think more. Uh, mm, because Incosidron is pretty much energetically the most favorable shape. Mm. Oh. Ditto for, for helico. It's also a very economical shape to package a nucleic acid, and it happened on several occasions. In mm. So you said that the, the plus strand is the, is the simplest. No Indeed. polymerase comes in the cell, it's translated. I have a hard time understanding why, what was the driving or the selection for the other forms. I can see double-stranded RNA, maybe it's more stable, right? But the negative strand seems a big jump for you to put a polymerase in the particle. Do we? Well... Well, the thing of the matter is this. Uh, uh, already the, the double strand, uh, you put the polymerase That's in right. the particle. That's you right. Must. That's right. Uh, um, uh, stability is fine, but I think there is a different issue here at mm-hmm. play. Uh, um, as in many, as many or most aspects of virus evolution. And that is escape from specific forms of host defense. Mm. In this particular case, in eukaryotes, escape from RNAi, uh, mm, mm, RNA interference. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm, uh, uh, because uh, in the case of double strand RNA versus and negative strand RNA versus, the replicating genome is isolated from the cytosol. Right. Uh, mm, and the mm, uh, RNA. Mm, Interference machinery, which involves large protein complexes, cannot penetrate into those particles. Yeah, this is not the case in positive sense virus. Yeah, that's that's a good. I, I like that very much. You said that uh, in the evolution of these uh, uh, replic, uh, um, one of my replicators, uh, replicators, okay. that there were two branches of double-stranded RNA viruses. Is that correct? Oh, I, I, I said that, but I have to be a little more specific. Uh, mm, uh, when we spoke about the uh, big tree of RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, mm-hmm. right. in that case, uh, there were indeed two branches of double-stranded RNA viruses uh, uh, that mm, mm, emerged from different parts of the positive sense of virus diversity. So, that, so I'm interpreting this correctly that the double-stranded RNA strategy em- emerged on two separate occasions. At least. Okay. All right, so can you, can you do a similar analysis with DNA viruses? Yes, we can and we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm, uh, but the methods must be somewhat different. The approaches must be somewhat different. Mm-hmm. For a very simple reason, uh, mm, uh, that there is no universal marker mm-hmm. for all DNA viruses. There's simply not a single gene that they all share. Mm. <laughs> even if we only limit ourselves to double-strand DNA viruses, yeah. even in that case, uh, there is no single gene that we would share. Mm. Mm-hmm. So we have to, or uh, mm, we still do trees for subsets of that diversity, mm, profitably enough. Yeah. Um, uh, but uh, if we want to um, somehow analyze the entire diversity within a single methodological framework, uh, we need to, rever- to turn to different types of methods, to methods such as um, um, analysis, statistical analysis of uh, networks of gene sharing, um, which we also have done, um, and... Um, 
isolated, well-connected modules, mm -hmm. shared genes, uh, largely involved, uh, largely but not solely involved in structure formation and morphogenesis of mm -hmm. viruses. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you do this, what what's the scenario of emergence, just like we we did for the RNA viruses? Mm, uh, uh, yes. Uh, mm, uh, mm, the scenario of emergence. <laughs> uh, mm, mm. I don't think he likes the word. Oh, the word emergence, yes. It's yes, okay. I, uh. I do. I like the word emergence, and uh, even, uh, or maybe in particularly in terms of emergent properties. And so okay. These are actually good okay. physical terms. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, mm, uh, so in 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 any case, uh, mm, the thinking goes along similar lines, uh, namely, uh, mm, starting the origin of emergence uh, mm, of uh, mm, um, double stra simple double stranded DNA replicants, such like like DNA plasmids. Mm -hmm. uh, linear plasmas, perhaps, to, to begin with, uh, followed by capture of capsid proteins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So double-stranded is first? Um, I think so. I think so. That double-stranded double uh, replicating genomes emerge first, mm -hmm. and then uh, capture capsid proteins. Although, um, it's, it's a viable possibility that the whole thing begins with single-stranded DNA replicants. Yeah. Mm, and and then the evolution of uh, mm, double-stranded DNA replicants already occurs within the virus world. I I kind of think that it's still a preferable scenario where mm, mm, double-stranded DNA emerges. Okay, virus. right, and and that's really it because the diversity among DNA is single-stranded or double-stranded, right? They don't have the diversity like we do in the RNA. Right. Virus world. Oh, uh, diversity in, in genome structures. Yeah. It's either single or double stranded DNA, right? Oh, well, I yes. guess it could be linear or circular, right? It can be linear or circular, indeed. Uh, the polarity matters less yeah. here. Yeah. Even, yeah. In single -stranded, even in single stranded DNA viruses, they all replicate for a double stranded intermediate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm, oh, yeah. Oh, mm, but still, there is diversity. The. Oh, mm, oh, the single-stranded DNA viruses are very distinct from double-stranded DNA, or in the evolutionary histories that can that we can infer. Yeah. Now, now then, I mean, we're talking about small beginnings, but then there are some viruses that have accumulated many genes, and we know that some have the entire translation without, except for the ribosome, right? right. So, is that a matter of acquiring things? Yes. Mm. That is. All a matter of acquiring things and acquiring them piecemeal. Uh, even though it is, it is very amazing indeed that some um, la very large giant DNA viruses encode effectively all components of the translation <laughs> machinery except for the ribosome itself. Mm, still, then we look at the phylogenies of these Mm, components of the translation machinery, they have different origins, yeah. indicating that they have been uh, mm, uh, acquired at different stages of virus evolution from different hosts. And right. we don't understand yet what the function of these translational components is. We just speculate, right? Effectively, we just speculate. In a way, there is no real doubt in that they speaking very generally, modulate the uh, functions of the translation machinery yeah, in the infected yeah. cells. Right. Uh, but why does that happen in some hosts, in some viruses and in some hosts, and not at all in others? Hmm. And it's not directly, um, there is a positive correlation with the genome, the uh, um, uh, um, genome size of the virus, and the abundance of these these components, uh, mm, uh, but nothing close to direct proportionality. Mm -hmm. There are very large ones 
that contain a whole lot and smaller ones uh, that contain very few uh, uh, and uh, significantly smaller ones that contain many or almost yeah. all, as yeah. we discussed. So it is not simple. It's clearly uh, depends on aspects of virus host relationship and interaction that we do not understand. A student asked me the other day, could a virus encode the entire ribosome? So I told her I would ask you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, mm. Could could it or could it not? I think it's very unlikely. Cons mm. uh, mm. And, uh, uh, by the way, it would be interesting for the student to know that uh, some viruses, bacteriophages in particular, actually do encode ribosomal proteins. Mm. Mm -hmm. Not that many, but right. there are quite some viruses that, that include, uh, encode a few ribosomal proteins, different sets. Now, however, entire ribosome. Very unlikely, I think. Why, why it's very unlikely, besides the lack of precedent, which is admittedly not a very strong argument, besides the, beside the fact that you need many components, which is, of course, some sort of argument, but Many other components, such as, for instance, a complete set of amino acid tRNA synthetases, is there in some virus. So it's still a legitimate question. But I think very difficult for, for at least the following reason. Mm. Uh, there is, uh, in eukaryotes, where these giant viruses live, uh, there is a very specific concerted mechanism of uh, mm, uh, ribosomal subunit biogenesis assembly uh, that occurs in the nucleolus. Mm. So, mm, uh, and uh, mm, uh, it's coupled to the transcription of the ribosomal RNA genes. Mm. Uh, the ribosomal proteins evidently have to go back to the nucleus. Uh, mm, but the ribosomal RNAs go nowhere. And this uh, assembly mechanism is coupled to the transcription processing. Mm, so, if your virus mm. makes ribosomal RNA, it has to cheat on that host machinery, somehow supplying mm, uh, its own ribosomal RNAs to, um, uh, to circumvent that machinery. Yeah, well, that or might be a... else acquire the entire machinery. Or do something different, like the pox viruses, do it in the cytoplasm, away from the nuclear bureaucracy. Yeah, right? so, yes, so. true, but, but can you actually reinvent that view, the ribosomal assembly machinery? Now that starts to strain our credulity. Very yeah, strongly. and the ribosomal RNAs are also really heavily modified, lots yeah. of methylations of different types. Uh, and my guess is there's a lot of chaperoning involved in in uh, assembling these things. In the assembly of the right. ribosomes, uh, I didn't specifically mention chaperoning, but yes. Yeah. Uh, mm, uh, these, are, these are called organelles, the nucleoli, yeah. Yeah. Uh, that are dedicated uh, mm, to the uh, assembly of the uh, mm, ribosomal particles. Um, mm, for that matter, it, it might be easier imaginable that prokaryotic viruses would have something like that. Mm, oh, oh, but in those, we do not really see any significant presence of the translation machinery beyond tRNAs. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's a compelling argument, but you could argue as a sampling bias. And maybe a lot of the dark matter in the eukaryotic viruses whose functions we don't understand or, or a novel ribosomal biogenesis, maybe it's a total protein ribosome instead of RNA based. I mean, anyway, I know I'm stretching it, but they're... they're okay. The, the, oh. Then going into the realm of sheer speculation, they can speculate on anything. Uh, uh, but... I don't want to be unreasonable. I understand. Remaining within... Remaining within... Sure. Anything, I mean, anything that does not contradict the laws of physics. <laughs> uh, mm, uh, yes, right. Uh, mm, uh, but 
uh, but remaining reasonably close sure. to the known molecular biology. I think there is no way to, to, okay. to, to get a virus with a ribosome. All right. So I'm thinking about a figure from one of your uh, papers on evolution of the DNA viruses okay. that, uh, if I recall the figure correctly, has uh, a lineage that uh, at its root has tectiviruses and evolves through an intermediate that uh, essential to which is polytons. Polyntons. Yes. Polyntons yes. that spins out adenoviruses and a few other viruses and then at the at the apex of this is megaviralis. And then another thing, uh, another section questionably related to megaviralis that are the baculoviruses and nudiviruses, uh, and then herpes viruses on a completely different uh, uh, lineage. I is that still your... Your conception of this, or is that evolved? Yes, this is still our conception of this, and it has not appreciably evolved. We are adding some elements here and there, but it has not substantially changed at all. Uh, and I should say that I'm impressed by the um, uh, degree of your accurate recollection of this case. Well, it was last night that I was looking at <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So... Uh, uh, does that? Are you thinking that there, that those evolutions are in fact independent of each other, or do you suspect that there's some common ancestor somewhere? I think we can be confident here for once, mm -hmm. uh, in that uh, for these two major realms of double strand DNA viruses, uh, there is no common ancestor. Okay. May May I ask your thoughts on? Uh, Yara virus? Uh, you certainly may, uh, but it will be incomplete uh, because the genome is still unavailable. I see. Oh. It's a, it's a bioarchive preprint, right? Yeah. Correct. Uh, That's interesting. The, you can put something in bioarchives and you don't have to deposit the sequence. You don't have to. Uh, okay. uh, I don't think it is very... Proper, all right, but 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 you don't have to technically, okay. um, and at least for any kind of official channels, the sequences are not available all just right, yet. All right. uh, from what I can decipher from that paper, um, um, without doing any analysis myself, um, it is highly unusual, but still, it is not really correct. Uh, to say that it is a virus uh, that consists entirely of orphan genes. Not really so. Uh, we know in the grand scheme of the virus world, we understand where it belongs. Because it has um, a particular uh, type of capsid protein, the uh, 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 double jelly roll right. uh, capsid protein, uh, of the exactly the kind that Rich has just been talking about, uh, uh, which is shared by all these uh, Tecti viruses, polyntons, adenoviruses, and mega megaviruses, all of them, um, as well as the uh, um, uh, packaging ATPs that goes hand in hand with that right. in the great majority of these viruses. Mm, so this is also present in Yara virus, indicating that it represents some division within the same realm of double strand DNA virus. Granted, that may be, may, might be a very high rank division. Okay. So when the sequence is available, you'll look at it, I'm sure. Evidently. <laughs> and we'll see, we'll read about it. Okay, we look forward to that. Uh, at some point you will read about it. Maybe we will not dedicate any special article to that, but somewhere, yes. Depends how how agitated you get, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, now, let, let's talk about this paper, which is going to be published in a few days, maybe? A couple of weeks, I believe, something like that. Global Organization and 
proposed mega taxonomy of the virus world. Yes. yes. Can you, do you mind speaking about it a little bit? No, I don't mind at all, of course. Well, it's not published yet. Some people don't want to... No, no, there is, there is absolutely no issue. It, is, it has passed the proof stage, but in any case, I don't mind. Um, mm, mm, uh, so, mm, so that is a big generalization on the overall structure of the uh, mm, uh, virus. Well, that is... Um, mm, what we already covered to a large extent, uh, mm, uh, these uh, Baltimore classes with different strategies of information storage and uh, transmission, and their evolutionary status. Mm -hmm. uh, which of them uh, mm, uh, are uh, monophyletic, indeed come from the common ancestor, uh, which of them are not, and in which cases two different classes actually do have a common origin, mm -hmm. as let us say is the case for... Mm, mm, uh, DNA containing and RNA containing reverse transcribing viruses, and even for reverse transcribing uh, viruses and RNA viruses, and regular RNA viruses, uh, or for instance, um, for single stranded DNA viruses and small double stranded DNA viruses like papilloma and polyoma, mm -hmm. uh, which also have a common origin. Uh, anyhow, uh, we delineate uh, at a coarse grain level. R relatively coarse grain level, uh, the entire architecture mm -hmm. of, the, the, uh, of the world of viruses. And we, from, as we make this the foundation of what we call megataxonomy, uh, the major taxa of viruses that surprisingly actually have been approved by the executive committee of the <laughs> International Committee of, you know, on Taxonomy of Viruses. Mm. Now, taxonomy, of course, is a, is a, is a boring, uh, tedious business, uh, mm, uh, but I think it's much less boring when it is directly based on evolutionary analysis. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm, yeah. So, how does the Baltimore scheme hold up in, in your classification? Better refresh for the viewers the Baltimore scheme. Oh, yeah. Eugene right. can do that, yeah. Yes, yes, they can. Uh, so the Baltimore scheme, which uh, was uh, published first almost 50 years ago, in fact, it will be wow. anniversary next year, uh, by David Baltimore in, in, in 71, in the wake of the discovery of Earth transcriptase in his lab, um, and, and sermons in parallel. Uh, mm, uh, <laughs> and this, this is really a seminal paper, although it's purely a sort of exercise in organizing the information on uh, replication and expression of viral genomes, which separates viruses into seven classes uh, based on what they incorporate into, what form of nucleic acid they incorporate right. into the appearance, and accordingly, how do they express that information. Right. Um, so, seven classes, um, it's, it's easy to list them, uh, double-strand DNA viruses, uh, which have the same uh, mm, uh, mm, uh, flow chart for information storage and expression as we, as all cellular life forms, that is. Single-stranded DNA viruses that include, uh, incorporate into variants small single-stranded DNA molecules, mm -hmm. which are their genomes. Um, mm, uh, Double-strand RNA viruses, uh, mm, positive-sense RNA viruses, uh, mm, negative-sense RNA viruses, RNA-containing reverse transcribing viruses and DNA-containing reverse transcribing viruses. That latter class uh, mm, uh, hasn't been really known at the time that Baltimore published his paper in 71 and it was added, I'm not entirely mm. sure by who, a few years later. So that's the seventh class. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, that's, I was trying to find out who added that. And I am not quite sure. And I asked you to, to find out. <laughs> but uh, and we tried. We tried. And we tried. Uh, uh, and we cited some paper, but to be completely candid, I am not quite sure that the paper is not a review. And it's yeah, not, yeah. It's so you haven't seen it. this. No, I haven't seen But this it. is the Baltimore scheme reimagined, right? Right, cool. With, an, with very nice pictures and... Polymerases of various sorts. So. Great. So anyway, the, the yeah. How does so, that so this is a Baltimore classification, uh, and there has been, I think, always 
an underlying hypothesis, um, sometimes spelled out, but most often not, mm -hmm. uh, that um, um, uh, these were also uh, um, the principal monophyletic groups of viruses, viral groups having a common origin, uh, and accordingly a solid foundation for the high stacks of viruses. Uh, now we show that in general this is untrue. Mm. Mm. Uh, that I mean, they do not uh, completely show that in this paper it's mostly a synthesis of things. Yeah. In different sources by uh, ourselves and others. Mm, uh, so, uh, uh, but anyhow, we explicitly explain that uh, mm, uh, this is not the case. Uh, in sort of both directions in both senses, that some of the Baltimore classes have a single common origin, despite the, di uh, the existence of a different form of uh, virion of, geno of the genome, or um, of the virion incorporated mm. nucleic acids, such as, for instance, uh, all classes of RNA viruses, along with the two classes of uh, um, reverse transcribing viruses, have a common origin. Mm -hmm. Mm, which we imagine is the reverse transcribing or um, mm, simply RNA replicon, primordial type of replicon. Right. Right. Uh, and conversely, however, all double-stranded DNA viruses um, mm, do not have a common origin. They have multiple origins for that mm. matter. Um, yeah, there are these two major, major modules uh, that Rich mentioned, mm, mm, uh, one including all these giant viruses and adenoviruses and uh, tectiviruses, etc., etc., and the other one including the tailed bacteriophage and herpes viruses that have completely different origins. Mm, mm, but then there are also uh, um, polyoma and papilloma viruses mm -hmm. that have completely, dif uh, di completely different third origin. And then there are various kind of mysterious viruses such as those uh, that um, in fact um, hyperthermophilic archaea right. whose origins we don't really understand too well uh, but, but they're definitely unrelated to any of the bigger um, so that's uh, it's yeah. interesting not only are the double-stranded DNA viruses not monophyletic relative to the other Baltimore classes, but they're polyphyletic within themselves. Precisely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, mm, yeah. That is precisely the case. Uh, mm, and then we have the very interesting evolutionary story of single-stranded DNA viruses that apparently are non, not monophyletic either. Uh, right. That apparently uh, evolved on multiple occasions in evolution from two components. Again, you know, in, in the in accordance with that um, uh, chimeric scenario whereby uh, the replicative and structural modules have different origins. Um, so in the case of single-stranded uh, DNA viruses, uh, <coughs> uh, they um, um, uh, evolved on multiple uh, occasions from a plasmid uh, that recruited uh, a capsid protein from RNA viruses. Is that this? Uh, this uh, exactly. It's yeah. This so the figures here are really very nice. But yeah, I look forward to this. Uh, so, um, what does this do to the taxonomy? Because uh, a if if um, I have a pretty naive understanding, but my naive understanding of a say a Linnaean type taxonomy is that it assumes uh, a common ancestor and then breaks off into phyla and genera and species and etc. But if it's polyphyletic, you can't do that with viruses, right? You're right. Oh, you cannot do it with all viruses as a single scheme, period. It's simply not doable and no one attempts. But you have a riboviria now, which yes. has all the RNA, because as you said before, we can have a yeah. common and, and although it, it's called riboviria, it also has DNA viruses that use reverse transcription in the reproduction, such as hepatitis B and the newly discovered relatives. Right. Mm, uh, mm, uh, so uh, the thing of the matter is uh, that we do not have a single super taxon that 
would be called viruses or, right, or, right, vir right, or right, vira right. or whatever. Right. What is so, uh, riboviria? What level of... Yeah, I was or, or this is something that... Uh, this is a taxon that um, uh, now it's formally recognized in virology, uh, but does not exist uh, in the um, taxonomy of cellular life forms called realm. Realm, okay. Yes. Right. Uh, and uh, at this point we have four of these realms. One is the riboviria, uh, the other is called monodnaviria, and these are single-strand DNA viruses. Right. Mm. <laughs> and then there are two, uh, mm, oh, mm, uh, um, two realms of, of double-stranded DNA viruses. Is that the Davidnaviria? Uh, yes, Davidna and, uh, and Diplodna. And then I suppose there are orders within the realms? No, 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 not so fast. <laughs> uh, no, there are five within the realms. Okay. Uh, no, not even so fast. Uh, there are kingdoms within the realms, hmm. and five within kingdoms, and classes within five, and then orders within classes. Wow. So what are the viricota? Is, what level is that? Uh, uh, um, uh, viricota is kingdom. Kingdom. So we also have a Bamford viria, Dennis Bamford. Yes, it's to honor Dennis Bamford, and there are others for some outstanding virologists as well. Helveda, Helvetia vira. Who does that? Anyone? Or is that Switzerland? Oh, this is Switzerland, and I should say uh, that um, uh, these names um, uh, have been pretty much single-handedly invented by my. Co-author and collaborator in this Yen school. Yen's, I thought so. <laughs> mm, uh, who, who is uh, by far more linguistically gifted than I am or any of the other co-authors. Uh, mm, okay. And we made just some some triage, pretty much. Yeah. You know, some names that seem too esoteric for us. So I see now the Dividna Viria. Yeah. And then below it are the Vira. It's different. You leave an eye out. It's a different oh, level. Of oh, so, 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 so have I made a mistake, actually? Then Viricota would be what, then? Uh, yeah, yeah I guess Viricota is a phylum, then. So Vira... And Vira is a kingdom. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah. Yeah, Vira is the kingdom. Mm, yeah. And then, then we have... I'm making these mistakes myself. Then Virales is the order. That's an order. Order. And then Viridae is the family. In below, Correct. Right. Yes. This is a really wonderful uh, paper. In terms of... Them. You know, you. Uh, evolution globally, viruses are really their own thing, right? Oh, <laughs> if not several things. Okay. Yeah. And so, is there uh, a taxon higher than realm? Oh, not formally for sure. Oh, whether um, it has any right to exist. Is a complicated issue, and <laughs> I guess not. If there, if all of these are, if you can't find a common ancestor, you cannot really find a common ancestor. Right. At the same time, as I said earlier in this discussion, the RRM domain lies at the bottom of, of um, effectively all replication machinery in all viruses that have replication machinery. And I think it's primary that they have it. Um, quite many have lost, but that's a different story. Mm. So, at some level, there are common ancestral elements there. Okay. But no, no such, for sure, no such thing as a common ancestral virus. Okay. Um, as the last universal viral ancestor that would be in some sense, and now it goes to the lost universal cellular ancestor. Mm, that does not exist. Uh, that uh, has never existed, uh, mm, uh, and there is no chance that this position will change. So, on the basis of all evidence and considerations, mm, uh, I do not think that there is any chance of an umbrella taxon above the realm. Okay. They will remain separate. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. One more thing I wanted to ask, and then we'll stop. 
Um, so we talked about capsids being acquired, and you can, if you look very hard, you can see the relationship between viral structural proteins and cellular genes. Yes. What are what other genes can we see have been exapted from cells? Oh yeah, mm, well, mm, there are quite a few, uh, mm, um, and uh, they spread uh, among viruses differs very dramatic. Mm -hmm. uh, mm, for instance, there are a large uh, group of groups of RNA viruses, uh, large text in this uh, classification uh, mm, uh, that have acquired uh, mm, RNA helicases of different families. Uh, that happened mm. uh, at least three times mm. in the uh, mm, uh, evolution of uh, RNA viruses. Apparently, uh, so there there is some driving force behind this. It seems mm -hmm. like some kind of evolution driving force. Uh, force if it happens convergently on multiple occasions, mm, and it seems like that evolution driving force is the opportunity, sort of opening up of the genome, the opportunity for expanding the genome, acquiring more genes. Still replicating right. uh, mm, uh, a large genome accurately and fast enough. Does this include the coronavirus helicase? Absolutely, yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, one of them. Uh, mm, then a variety of proteases, for instance, were acquired by RNA viruses. Mm, now, if you go to uh, mm, uh, DNA viruses, uh, mm, uh, then mm, Again, these, these have acquired multiple helicases involved in replication and transcription uh, at uh, different st uh, stages. Now, even, actually, even more fundamental acquisition deep in evolution is the acquisition of transcription machinery itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All that happened. We already touched upon translation system mm -hmm. components that have been acquired. Right. Uh, but right. also many... Things that look somewhat, uh, in larger viruses, of course, many things that look rather weird, there is metabolic pathways, yeah. relatively short one oftentimes, but, but still, metabolic pathways mm, mm, uh, that uh, mm, uh, contribute evidently uh, mm, uh, to virus cost in interaction and the functioning of the virus inside the cell, but we do not necessarily understand why this and not another? Though, in some occasions, actually, that understanding is pretty apparent, and that's fascinating. For instance, bacteriophages that infect cyanobacteria, they oftentimes uh, mm, uh, carry uh, mm, uh, one or even two uh, mm, uh, photosystems more in the more or less complete mm -hmm. form. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm, and it's quite, quite a few genes. Uh, and these are shuttled between hosts and um, apparently allow the host upon an infection to sustain photosynthesis. Um, mm, or most interestingly, something I was quite involved in, uh, it turns out that uh, mm, uh, many giant viruses that uh, mm, uh, infect uh, marine algae and possibly other protists uh, mm, uh, have captured uh, mm, uh, rhodopsids from either uh, bacteria or apparently from bacteria, uh, mm, uh, which again uh, mm, modify the behavior of the hosts in ways that we do not quite understand mm, just yet. Mm. So sometimes you can link it to biology, but in a yeah, okay. greater number of occasions it is difficult and remains to be done. And then there are the pox virus proteins that in interface with the immune system, right? Well, of course. Yeah. Uh, mm, um, mm, uh, eukaryotic large viruses, pox, and yeah. to, a, to, to a smaller but mm, significant extent, herpes and vacuola uh, mm, have uh, in, uh, acquired uh, mm, uh, different uh, mm, uh, proteins that interfere uh, with the host defense mechanisms, programs so death and immunity. Can you look at uh, viral genes and see what host it came from based on those kinds of acquisitions? Uh, on a broad scale, yes, yes. No, for instance, uh, mm, if, if you are shown a pox virus genome uh, mm, in isolation, they are not told where this comes from. Mm -hmm. A quick analysis, a few minutes, 
oh, maybe maybe now, oh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll show you oh, that this only can be um, a vertebrate virus, a virus infected some vertebrate. Vertebrate, okay. Some vertebrate for sure. Uh, uh, because um, even probably a memo you would figure out. Uh, because they carry uh, uh, components of the uh, homologs of the components of the complement machinery uh, and that, as we know, function as dominant inhibitors, but uh, anyhow, uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, um, could have been acquired only from uh, uh, those, uh, those hosts. Um, more specifically, it may be difficult. All right. You have anything else, Dr. No, I Pondic? think I'm done, unless uh, Eugene has some surprises for us. You have any surprises? <laughs> surprises? Uh, surprise maybe not, but I would like to add something. Yeah, of course. Um, uh, so, so I think that uh, we have been discussing for a while today uh, uh, various insights into the evolution of viruses that uh, uh, have uh, uh, been reached in the last few years. Um, I think it's good also for everyone to uh, um, uh, be aware of the methodological basis of mm -hmm. most of these insights. Uh, um, and th this methodological basis is um, uh, um, uh, the new techniques of metagenomics. Mm -hmm. Um, because nowadays it's a plain and simple fact that the huge majority of new viruses that we recognize, that we identify, only come from metagenome and metatranscriptome sequencing, um, rather than from their traditional uh, isolation methods. That means taking some, some bulk source of nucleic acid. Exactly. Okay, and sequencing it and finding within those sequences something you think is a virus. Uh, yes, something that we can uh, predict with different degree of accuracy, but most of the time with good accuracy, uh, uh, is, is a virus. Uh, and the diversity that we are discovering by uh, these methods, uh, which evidently put a huge emphasis on the computational approaches for sure. genome analysis, mm -hmm. um, uh, is incredible. Um, um, and so, so all these... Um, Generalizations on virus evolution, all these, um, um, all these classific new classification, etc., would not have been really possible uh, without this uh, this new uh, methodology of metagenome and metatranscriptome sequencing that became available in the last that has matured within the last six seven years. Let us say. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's. When we speak about on the higher plane, it's it it it's rather important to remember. Yeah, this. that's yeah. good. I appreciate that. Now, now, does your lab look out for new metagenomic sequences and mine it to see if there's something interesting? Absolutely, we do. Mm. Oh, with considerable intensity. Okay, and then you also have focused projects that are on genomes that you know, and you're looking for proteins of interest. Oh, um, yeah, yes, yes, well. yes, yes, we okay. do, of course. Uh, but indeed, much of the emphasis in the virus-oriented part of the lab now uh, is on metagenome analysis. And so give us an idea of how much new sequence is produced. I'll give you an idea very <laughs> easily. Uh, um, just using an example, not sure. giving a general number, but using an example. Uh, we now have a paper in revision uh, on the analysis of a particular metagenome, or metatranscriptome rather, mm -hmm. RNA sequences from a particular location uh, mm, uh, in, mm, in the estuary of Yangtze River in, in China. Mm -hmm. mm, mm, so Chinese collaborators actually uh, mm, took just something like 10 liters of water. And concentrated and, and sequenced the metatranscriptome. And what, from that single sample, from a rich environment, granted, from, from a single sample, mm -hmm. uh, they uh, got another doubling of the diversity of RNA virus <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, at the level of roughly a virus genus. Right. Uh, we have not uh, uh, discovered a new major branch. 
a few qu- very interesting groups within the existing yeah. branches, yeah. not no major uh, branch, uh, but the diversity itself doubled from a single sample. Mm. You think you'll have anything above genus in the future? No, we have we have stuff above genus there. So already, I know, but will there be new things above genus, new branches, as you said? Absolutely, yes. And in that study that I referred to, uh, there are surely branches at the level of a family, very likely at the level of, a, of an order, mm-hmm. quite possibly at the re- level of a class. Mm-hmm. But I'm pretty sure not at the phylum level. Okay. Fascinating. So this is one 10-liter sample from a river. So it, wherever you went, would you have the same... F- uh, output of information? I wouldn't say wherever, uh, because this is a rich environment. Yeah. And if you go, and if or rather when we have such projects as well, yeah. you go out into the ocean, you get much less. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but at the same time, there are many habitats like this. Yeah, there are many rich environments, yeah. So you could. Many rich environments. Uh, mm, uh, so at that level, uh, we are not out of the exponential phase. That's great. I love account. it. I love it. So uh, this is uh, sort of on the side of the science. A lot of the uh, several of the recent papers that have really been groundbreaking in this regard have as co-authors Val- Valerian Dolja yes. and uh, Mart uh, Koprovich. Am I pronouncing Absolutely, that yes, correctly? Correct. Correct. And now you've been uh, colleagues with Valerian for many many years, right? Correct. Well, how, I'm interested in how the collaboration with uh, Mart evolved, because he's in Paris, right? He's now in Paris, indeed. <laughs> oh, mm, mm, oh, so, oh, mm, I visit him somewhat frequently there, oh, mm, <laughs> oh, but oh, mm, mm, oh, oh, how it evolved is, 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 is very interesting, and I'm pleased to tell you about it. Oh, mm, uh, so, uh, we mm, uh, first met with Mart, at least as far as I remember, but probably my recollection is correct, uh, at one of the Archeo Gordon Conference on the Molecular Biology and Genomics and mm. Ecology of Archaea, um, mm, probably about eight years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right before we spoke on this uh, series, uh, yeah, the last time. Mm, uh, so... Uh, and we actually first had some disagreements about virus evolution because we, um, when Mart was with Dennis Bar- Bumford in Helsinki, uh, mm, they sort of developed this kind of capsid-centric mm-hmm. picture of uh, mm, mm, uh, virus evolution, with which I strenuously disagreed at that time, uh, mm, uh, which, which I appreciate much better these days. Still thinking it's incomplete, though. Um, but anyhow, we started with disagreements. But when we started talking in greater detail, we realized that our approaches and our actual views of evolution beyond semantics uh, uh, were quite close and compatible. And it would be interesting to try uh, and advance them together. As a result of this, uh, um, we obtained some fellowship for Mart um, to visit here in the spring of 2014. In fact, I think he arrived here just maybe a couple of days after our interview mm-hmm. at the March. Time. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Or potentially my memory is not serving and he was already here. He may he have been not here. directly involved. <laughs> uh, mm, uh, so in any case, so that, that visit was... Uh, mm, Immensely productive, I would say. Um, we, in particular, we have managed to show that the polyntons were viruses and, mm-hmm. and published that, and then we uh, made important inroads into the origin and evolution of CRISPR systems mm-hmm. and beyond. A lot has been accomplished. And since then, we have been collaborating very actively um, for those six years, and I hope we are not slowing down too much. And I just want to point out that I invited Mart to ASV in 2015. Right, okay. When I was president, because right. I had already seen things he was publishing 
in that year you published already, and I saw it, and I thought this would be very interesting to have him. And he did, and I. And you were both on the program, I think. And we were both on the program, I think, one after another, after the other. Yeah. Uh, and uh, mm, uh, I think for Mart, it was uh, one of his first, I know I can't a lot, but one of his uh, first uh, major lectures at a yeah. meeting like this. So this was very much appreciated. Yeah, I, th- I love this. It, the work is beautiful. Yeah, so, the work is And then fun. we heard more at the giant virus meeting and continues to be... Right. And I love the poli- the primer independent polymerase story. There was another where he showed some ribosomal proteins encoded in viruses are incorporated into the ribosome, Absolutely, actually. Right? Yes. So, wonderful stuff. I love it. Okay. Well, well, Eugene, we have kept you for two hours. Now Is that we, right? My pleasure. We How will, did that go, by we, we will let you go. That has been a special TWIV. You can find our show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. By the time we released it, uh, your review should be out, and we'll put a link to that in the show notes. If you have any questions, send them to twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we are doing with these podcasts, consider supporting us. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute and give it as little as a, a dollar or two a month to help Rich and I and the others travel and uh, have conversations like this. Our guest today from the National Institutes of Health, Eugene Coonan, many, many thanks again. This was really a really nice conversation for us. I hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> Vincent Rich, it's, it's a huge pleasure to be involved in this, and I do hope some listeners find or and viewers find it interesting. Oh, the last one people loved. They said it was an amazing... They said yeah. that it was two hours yeah. also last time. They yes. loved it. Right. And they said it was one of the best they... Yeah. Have seen so we appreciate it. This is different from what we usually talk about because we we don't really know this, and so anyway, we appreciate it. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas, for the fourth time. Rich, thank you very much. <laughs> Always a good time, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. Thanks to ASV and ASM for their support and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, produced, and posted by me, Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>